Welcome to Central United Methodist Church. Uh, we will pray together this morning. We will sing some great songs. Dennis Gossett is bringing us the message on fulfilling our purpose in life. Uh, so now Susan is here, and let's do some singing. Why don't y'all stand and join me in singing so I don't have to do a solo? Thank you. And just so you know, the full praise team is here this morning right before we split up for the exciting new services coming, and you'll hear more about that. But we're 100% here for you this morning, literally. <laughs> today to assign the registration pad it's somewhere on the end of the row and I also want to say to our visitors a very special welcome there's visitor information out in the crossing so if you have any questions there are people that would just love to tell you all the great things about this church good morning children good morning hi 
How are you doing? <laughs> How's everybody doing today? What do I have here today? I need a volunteer. I need somebody out here. Uh, let's see. Right here. Who's that? Come on up. <clears throat> now, you ever like to play a doctor or a mad scientist? Can you, can you give me a mad scientist cackle? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, that's good. Okay. You know, today, you know what I like? I like school. And school teaches me a lot of different things. And one of the subjects I really like is science. Who likes science? Awesome. Who likes math? Who likes broccoli? <laughs> okay. You know, well, today what we're going to do is that we're going to make something, an experiment. We're going to use some safe compounds, but when they put them together, it does something that's very volatile. Okay? But this is safe. That's why I got this big aquarium. Now, this is what I, what's your name? Kenan. Kenan what? Nelson. Kenan Nelson. Pleased to meet you, Kenan Nelson, even though I know you. I just want to make sure everybody knows who you are. Okay, can you do another thing, Kenan? I need you to put gloves because uh, this morning when I was mixing this stuff, <laughs> I actually did this. I got red dye all over my finger. So, you know, it's always good to have gloves on. And I need you to put safety glasses now, what's this have to do anything with the Bible? Well, you're going to have to wait for a moment. You ready? That's great. Now, look at me. How many eyes do I have? I have two. How many eyes do I have now? Four. How many eyes do I have now? Six eyes. Yeah. Two eyes, you're, it's great. Four eyes, you're awesome. Six eyes, you're one of a kind, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, Ken, you know what we're going to do? I have a vase in here, and I have some coloring here. Now, I have two compounds right here. You want to smell that? What's it smell like? Uh, baking soda. Baking soda. You want to smell that? Yeah. Very good. What's that smell like? That's right. What's it smell like? Can I, can I share your lollipop with the vinegar? No. You want to smell that? No, okay. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to mix these two compounds. Now, what I want you to do. Now, is baking soda safe by itself? What do you think, Ken? Yes. Yes, okay. Can you pour it into that there, please? All right. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I didn't measure properly, but when you're doing a lot of science experiments, you want to measure correctly, right? Now, with this vinegar, now, this baking soda kind of represents somebody in the Bible. And this vinegar represents somebody else. And I'll tell you that story here in a moment. Now, what do you think is going to happen when he pours that vinegar in here? You think it's going to explode? Let's find out. Go ahead and do so. Measure very carefully. You can come closer. What's happening? It's rising. And what color is it? Green. It's green? It's pink. It's pink. <laughs> That's right. It would overflow. And um, see, I didn't measure my experiment correctly, so it's going slowly. But you know what this reminds me of? Thank you, Kenan. I appreciate that. Can everybody give Kenan a hand here? Thank you. I appreciate that. Was that pretty cool? Okay. Now, this reminds me of a story. And Kenan, can you help me read this? You know, oh, no, that's right. These bubbles represent something. It's like the Holy Spirit, okay? Ken, in, in the book of Acts, this is what's really cool in the book of Acts, is that something happened so great to the disciples of Jesus that something great happened, and it said, can you read right here? When the day of, when the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and became to rest of each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak 
and in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Thank you. That's in the book of Acts. And now, the Holy Spirit is like these bubbles here. Now, sometimes we can just be ourselves. We can be like the vinegar, just ugh, nasty, sour, stinky, right? But the bacon soda is like the Jesus Christ that we know and God, because he sent his Holy Spirit. And when you mix both of those together and you ask for Jesus for forgiveness and ask him in your heart, this something wonderful happens right here. These bubbles will stay inside of you. And it will fill your heart with the love of Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? So next time when you go to school, when you talk to your science teacher, see if you can do something like this, huh? All right. Thank you, Cannon. All right. Now let's go ahead and do a prayer. You can put those right there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for letting us come together and enjoy this time with each other. And thank you for your son. In Jesus Christ, we all say amen. Thank you. As you can see, these are some, just some of the students who went to Breakthrough. This is our fourth year, I believe, to, to be invited back to Breakthrough. We go right after Christmas. I believe it's December 30th. Breakthrough is held at Timber Creek in Pulaski, Mississippi, which if you're like me, you had no idea where that is, but it's off the forest exit. And Timber, Timber Creek is a wonderful camp. And they host Breakthrough every year, and this year we had almost 40 students go. Uh, there were several decisions made to accept Christ and, and several decisions made to uh, change their lives, but now we're going to let some of our students that are here talk. Uh, this year at uh, Breakthrough, I feel like it was probably one of the best years. We had a big group go, and I felt like everybody uh, went and grew closer to Christ. It uh. It's a very positive experience for me, and that's it. Breakthrough this year was really fun. Well, it is every year, but this year it just felt like I just really grew closer to a lot of the people that went. Uh, I was chosen to be the leader of a small group, and I just got really close to those kids, and yeah. Me and Brad, uh, we were the small group leaders of the sixth graders. So it was a pretty fun experience, you know, seeing all that energy. And it was nice being able to kind of share some experiences that I've had and help them grow closer to God. They really, uh, it's nice to see that kind of freshness that they have for God. And it was just a real great experience because the music was fabulous. They have a band there every year, and we just worship. We give sermons every day, and it's just, it helps you really further your relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, Rachel and I, we were small group leaders this year, and we actually got surprised with it. And when we got there, we had to teach the 6th and 7th graders. And just seeing how those girls, they just opened their, they opened their hearts to God, and they came to us every day wanting to know more and more. And seeing that every day just made me think, I have to be a leader to them. And... Of course, I cried. I had to release everything that, all the sins that I had. And just ever since then, I've grown closer to Christ. And I've been doing devotions and everything. And I love Breakthrough. It is such a good experience. And every now and then, I'll go up and talk to those girls. And they're still telling me they're doing their devotions. So I feel good that they actually grew closer to Christ this year. And it's just a great experience for all. Uh, breakthrough this year was fantastic, as it always is, and it just showed me that God has some incredible things He's going to do in 2014 and all the years to come. This was my first year going to Breakthrough, and just being there, I felt like I grew a lot closer to God. Um, this year was really great, and I love getting to get closer to my youth group and everyone and to Christ, and it's just 
a really great way to start off the new year? Um, I didn't really know Christ, Christ before I went to Breakthrough. I, I knew that he loved us all and um, stuff like that, but it didn't really stick. So I did. I feel glad that I came here because I experienced a lot of stuff before I came to Breakthrough. Because last year I couldn't go. So God, I feel like God made a plan to me to experience all this stuff that happened last year. So he could tell me that he was there all along. Yes, I'm glad I came. This is my first year, and I'm glad that I met with God and stuff. And I'm glad that we had, like, small group leader because I didn't understand the sermons and stuff. But uh, but still, I still have fun and stuff, even though we joke around and stuff. But I came closer to God and, and my faith and stuff. Um, I've been going to Breakthrough for four years now, and it's been great every year. We've all gotten closer to God and closer to each other, and it's just a great thing to go to. This was my second year to Breakthrough, and it was a great experience, and it was really fun. <laughs> That's always my favorite part. The neat thing, and I won't take any more time, but the neat thing besides the support that we get from the church and all that we do is the fact that there are several students up here whose parents went to Breakthrough. And Breakthrough has kind of become a multi-generational event that a lot of our families look forward to sending their kids to. And so we do want to thank the church for allowing us to go. Thank you all. Freeze. You were amazed at the energy of those sixth grade boys. <laughs> there are some of us who remember when you were in sixth grade. <laughs> what goes around comes around. This coming weekend, on Friday, and, Friday night and Saturday, um, if you are married, you have the opportunity to um, come to a retreat here at Central. It is a retreat, it is a seminar. Um, we will not be staying overnight. Um, it is led by Reverend John Branning, but it is based on Mark Gunger's um, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. If any of you, those of you who are married know that you need laughter in a marriage. Um, Mark Gunger has been married for 30 plus years. He has been doing seminars for about the past 20 John has had the opportunity to lead this seminar several times, both in former churches and for the military. It will be broken up into four different sections. Um, the Tale of Two Brains, you'll see a little bit of a clip if you weren't here last week um, that shows this. Uh, it'll be broken up into The Tale of Two Brains, Intimacy and in Marriage, How to Be Married and Not Kill Someone, we can relate, and then Red Flags. It will begin Friday night. It will run from 6 until 8.30 Friday night and from 10 until 2 on Saturday. And then we will have date night, Saturday night, where you can come back and leave your children, if you have them, and um, go out for two and a half hours and spend some time together. I cannot tell you how important this is to put at the top of your calendar for this weekend. So many times you're sitting there and you're going... But if we go to the marriage seminar, they're going to think we're having problems. Think of this as like your annual checkup. This is preventive medicine, whether you've been married four years or whether you've been married 40 years. What I do need you to do this morning as this clip is running, your attendance pad, if you plan to go and have not yet signed up, there's a comment section on your attendance pad. 
All I need for you to do is to take it and put MR, marriage retreat, and then if you have children that are going to be staying in our nursery, simply put the age of your children. This is very important because we are trying to get nursery staffed for this event. So, you know, if you've got a two-year-old, you can't put them with a 12-year-old. So if you'll just put MR and the age, and we can turn our attention now to the screen and watch just a little bit of a clip of what you can look forward to this weekend. Can you the closest thing to heaven on earth if you do it wrong. <laughs> our, our very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got, we got, we, we got boxes everywhere. And, and the rule is the boxes don't touch. Discusses a particular subject. We go to that particular box. We pull that box out. We open the box. We discuss only what is in that box. <laughs> Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. <laughs> and everything is connected to everything. It's like the internet superhighway, okay? <laughs> and, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. <laughs> because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because quite frankly, we don't care. Now men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. <laughs> That's why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. That's why a guy can sit in front of a TV and go. <laughs> so you can see that's going to be a lot of fun, but it'll also be, uh, be very helpful. I want to mention uh, a couple of things to you. One, uh, condolences to Jerry Mitchell and his family following the death of his uh, grandmother, Opal Moore Mitchell. Uh, who died this last week. I also want to mention that Wednesday Night Live is beginning this Wednesday uh, with a great meal by Brooks Hunter uh, and then followed by a program. Uh, Vi McBride will be leading her Bible study. And then in here we will have a, a survey of denominations. Uh, various staff members will be leading that. We'll be beginning with Methodists so we understand what we believe with Methodist beliefs, and then the following week with what are all the Methodist denominations. Uh, but we'll, So we'll begin with Methodist, but then we'll go on and look at the other denominations uh, through this winter and spring. I also want to mention that next Sunday we begin Connect, the new worship service that will be at 945 in this room. Uh, the band has been rehearsing. They are ready. Uh, it promises to be an exciting time. So invite your friends to be a part of Connect. Invite your friends, especially who have not been attending worship at Central. This is a great opportunity for new people to come and be a part of Central. And secondly, I ask that you pray for this new service and for Central, that, uh, that the service will be a success and that Central will continue to reach out to new people. Now, if you'll take a moment, and I mean just a moment, and stand up and greet your neighbors, and then we'll go back to singing.
closer to God. Amen? You might be seated while we sing the next song. Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
rest in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Bow your head and pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning, and we thank you for loving us. We recognize you this day as our cornerstone, the foundation for all that we are, for all that we have. When we're troubled, in times of sorrow, you hold us up. When we have happiness and joy, you celebrate with us. There are so many times when we feel empty, we feel sad, but we know that you're there, you're holding, you're guiding, you're leading our every step of the way. Father, we're so thankful for that. There are so many here today who have difficulties, who have problems, who have things going on in their lives that they can't seem to handle. The world seems dark, it's hard, it's tough. We ask this morning, Lord, that you will just take each person by the hand as their need, as their need is there, and lead them through whatever it is that they need to be led through. God, we have so many people here today who are experiencing joys and celebrations and happies that there's just no way it seems to be able to explain it. But we know it's through your grace and your love and the mercy that you show us each and every day that we're able to enjoy and experience these things. And we thank you so much for it. God, we're so thankful for this church and the blessings that you've bestowed upon it and, and everyone involved. As we go forward this week, Lord, we just ask that you will continue to guide us in the direction that you would have us to go, that you would put our feet where they need to be. You will continue to be our foundation in each and everything that we undertake. For we know without you, without you, things are hard. But with you, anything and all things are possible. Again, Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. Just continue to bless us and forgive us for our failures, for they are many. But we still seek that each and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before the ushers come, let's share this morning in the offertory verse. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory and his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Sing with us as the ushers take up the offering this morning.
Today our scripture lesson is coming from Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. This is God's word for God's people. Praise God. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered in your house among these great witnesses of saints that are not just gathered here in the physical body, but are a present with you around your throne at this moment in eternity. Lord God, I pray that you will speak to your unworthy servant now. We raise all those falsehoods that may proceed from his lips, but speak truth to us. Prick our hearts, O God, with your eternal truths. For these things, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, today is my 19th anniversary, actually January the 12th. So uh, we have been celebrating all weekend. Thank you, thank you. Well, I can't believe it's been 19 years that Dawn has actually put up with all my tomfoolery, as the old folks would say, for all these years. Um, We were married on January 12th back in 1995. Well, since I love Christian history and particularly the biographies of faithful witnesses, I came across the story of a young lady whose life is remembered on this day, January the 12th. And it's usually celebrated in certain circles in the world throughout Christendom. And I would like to introduce you to her this morning. It is a young teenage girl, and her name was Tatiana. She was from Rome. And she lived during the reign of Emperor Alexandria Servius from 22, uh, 222, from about 235 A.D. And her parents were of great nobility, so they had great wealth and great influence there in, in Rome, and her father actually was a Roman civil servant, and he was a secret Christian, and he actually raised his, her, um, his daughter up in the faith. But these were during horrible, troubled times. Christendom, all of those who professed in Christ, was under persecution. It was very dangerous, and, and, and it, was, it was here during these times that actually the faith caught up with Tatiana. She was one day serving in a church, as she normally does in a local church, and she was a deaconess. She was always found fasting, praying, uh, giving works of charity, um, being merciful to the poor, and helping out the needy. And so one day, the, the, all the, the Roman officials came, and they, and they took her from the church, and they brought her before um, the tribunal there. Well, they also took her to the, the temple of Apollos, and they were trying to make her sacrifice to their God. But she refused. And so she began to pray, and legend has it, as she began to pray, At that moment, an earthquake came and and tore down the statue of Apollo and actually half of the temple with it. 
So in, in response to this, they began to torture her. So they tore out her eyes with hooks. And, and, but during all this, she bravely endured all these tortures, everything. Actually, they, they said that she actually began to pray for those who were tormenting her, that the Lord will actually open up their eyes, their spiritual eyes, to let them see the real truth. Well, something happened miraculous at that moment. It said that even eight of her tormentors converted to Christ at that moment, which is an amazing thing. But unfortunately, when you stand up for Christ, when you give all of yourself, when you fulfill your calling what God has called, called you into, the world goes against it. So eight of her captors who confessed Christ were actually tortured and, and martyred at the same time. So they threw her in prison. They brought her back out the next day. And Tatiana was, was once again before this wicked judge and seeing that she was completely healed, miraculously, of, of all of her uh, wounds. And he ordered her right then to be stripped and, and to be hung up and beaten and have her slashed with razors. But honestly, in the, in, in the stead of the smell of blood that one would, would normally associate with, with such torturous, they said that a wonderful fragrance would fill the entire uh, area around where she was at. There, stretched out on the ground, her torturers were, were commanded to beat her once more, again and again. It said it was got so bad that they actually had to, to uh, bring people in and out because everybody was getting so tired. But they couldn't get anywhere with her. So they just uh, threw her in, in prison once again for the night. And her torturer said that, that even throughout the night, they, they found this young teenage girl praying to God and singing songs and hymns and, uh, to his praise. Once again, she, she was brought back out, brought in front of the tribunal. It's a never-ending progress they, or process. They can't understand what to do with this young lady. And they, they beheld once again that, that all of her wounds were miraculously healed. And she was more healthy and, and beautiful than never before they've ever seen her. But once again, she was fiercely tortured. It seemed like a never-ending cycle. Again, they hung her up and, and began to scrape her with iron claws. They even cut off her breasts and did all these horrible things to her. But again, day after day, she becomes healed. She's praying. And people are, are around her are, are starting to convert to Christ. So they said, well, well we got to do something with this girl. She is, is, is causing such an uproar in our city. So what happened the next day is they took her to the arena, to the circus, they used to call it, there in Rome. You know, you've you seen that movie Gladiators? And here she's in this coliseum, and they, they, they loose a lion on her and, uh, within hopes that the lion will tear her to shreds. But through the intervention of God, legend has it that the lion just came and licked their feet. It's like a little dog or a little puppy would. So they were just so outraged, so the, the torturers began to, to take the lion back. Well, the lion turned on them and, and killed at least two or three of those. Now, why do I mention Tatiana to you today, especially on the uh, Advent or, say, the a day of my anniversary? Well, it is not to say that my marriage to Dawn is like torture. It is not. In fact, it's been heavenly bliss. And you can remind her of that from time to time if, if you would like. But seriously, Tatiana's life, a reason I wanted to, to mention this wonderful, this, uh, this young teenage girl, she, her life is such a great example, maybe, to, maybe an extreme example, but it is an, an example of someone who has lived into the fullness of their calling. This same calling that has been made on every single person here this morning. The same calling that 99%, now I don't know your background, I don't know um, how your journey in Christ, where you are right now, but at least I can guess 99% of you have proclaimed and accepted that calling at the moment of your baptism. So I want you to keep this in mind as we go through. Keep this story near to you as we work through our sermon today. But before uh, John encountered Jesus at the River Jordan, Matthew tells us John was out in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord. It says he came to preach in the wilderness saying, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John is, we see, look at John, he is an early a monastic figure for us. For all accounts, he gave up all of his worldly possessions, all of his worldly attachments to serve and be obedient to God. He lived in solitude. He lived in charity. He lived in fasting and lived in prayer. Now, John's ministry was most effective, though, in the wilderness, not in, not in the, the temples, not in the, 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 the center of town, but it was out in the wilderness where he was at. And on the effective 
effectiveness of this riverbank, people began to respond by his preaching, and they came forward to give their life to God, being baptized in the waters. Now, according to Matthew, the Messiah had not come yet. He, he has not revealed himself to the world at this moment. But however, here's this lonely monk in the wilderness prophesying that, that, that God is coming. That Messiah is on his way. Prepare your hearts, for he is coming. It is someone who is mightier than me, someone who's, who, 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 who embodies God himself, someone who I'm not even worthy to bend down and carry his sandals. And he announced that this person will not only come and baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But he also warned them, prepare yourselves, for it, this man this Messiah is the one who will also come bringing judgment onto the world, tossing the chaste souls into unquenchable fire. So John, taking this call seriously, made it a point that everyone that he preached to, everyone that he came encounter to, those who would take the time to stop and listen, to say, hey, prepare yourself. Prepare yourselves for the coming of the Messiah because it is imminent. And they were told to publicly announce that at their desire, publicly tell the world that you want to live a, another life, a life that is totally um, uh, separated from this world, a life that is totally devoted to God. So therefore, come down and be baptized in the water for repentance from your sins and from all the misplaced attachments that a lot of us, including myself, have to this world. Therefore, all came. They were baptized for repentance. And now, they said, since you have created such a, a wonderful, beautiful uh, uh, goal in, in life, a wonderful, beautiful path for yourself, now bring forth the fruit. Now bring forth those things that, that you have dedicated yourself to God. So before the people in this wilderness, God gives them an example. You know what's hard when, when we decide to, to follow God to, to, with our entire hearts? What does that actually look like, you know? But God, in his great mercy, he, he puts an example for us. So out here in the wilderness, here's this wonderful example of this man leading a life that totally devoted to God in, in chastity and, and, and in prayer. Someone who, who worships their God, the, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. The one who is totally devoted, sold out, as our modern day people would say, totally to God. So finally the day comes. The day comes when, when all of John's prophecies would come to its own fulfillment. And it was in the middle of, of where God had placed John, in the middle of this wilderness, in the middle of this desert, where Messiah comes. He was preaching and baptizing in the river just like any other day. And unbeknown to him, the man whom he has been prophesying about, the man whom he said the Savior and the Redeemer of all mankind, was sitting in that crowd that day. I can imagine that Jesus was, was kind of four or five rows deep, if you will, standing back listening. So after the invitation has been given, people began to, to do like they always do, to respond. They began to, to come down front and respond to the edge of the water. And I can imagine that as people began to, to, to form there on this bank, the line began to, to wind down the river. So John begins to baptize person after person, saying something like, I baptize you with a life of repentance. Therefore, bring forth the fruit that is worthy of such of a life. Well, then all of a sudden, the one whom he has been telling people about comes into the water, comes right down into the water where he is at. But, you know, he knows this person, that something is different about him because that same spirit, and it seems so familiar, but yet so far, the, that same spirit that stirred him inside of his mother's womb was now stirring inside of him once again. And the Lord begins to touch his life. And he knows it's the Messiah. So I can imagine dumbfounded. He's standing there and he, he's moving ever so closely to, to the Lord. And he reaches up and just touches the hem of his garment. Trying to say all those things that has been on his heart for years. In front of his entire congregation to say something something um, really theological, say something that will stir everybody's hearts, to say something that he's wanted to say all of his life, but the only words he can manage to get out is that, Lord, you come to me, but yet I should be baptized by you. That's all he can muster. But it is here. 
at this moment, the juncture of our story, that the Lord makes a profound announcement, an announcement that not only affects the present, but it affects the past and also the future. When he says this, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us, for us, to fulfill all righteousness. And then, Matthew says, John consented and baptized the Lord. Now, could you imagine what an honor that must have been to baptize the one whom you've been speaking about for so long, to baptize the Messiah in the River Jordan, in the midst of your ministry, in the midst of, of what you've been proclaiming all along. And, and soon after, John was, did, did the obedient thing to God. He, he was able to look up himself to see the heavens open, to see the Holy Spirit come down in the form of a dove and light on the Savior, and then hear God's voice. What an awesome thing. Fulfilling His purpose in life. And we wonder, well, why did Jesus need to be baptized for repentance? You know, He was without sin, therefore He he need not repent of of the sin that He's proclaiming that He's committed. Well, that is certainly true. We we know that, that it is beyond Him to sin. We know that he is the only begotten son, and he lived a life just like that of John, a life that was totally devoted to God, a life of simplicity, a life of chastity, a life of prayer, a life of fasting and charity. But yet it it, it, it was his life, the life that he had modeled, the life that, that he was living in such devoutness brought all these things, brought John's life, an example that God set before him to all of its fulfillment, to its totality. So the, the, the life that John chose to live was brought to the fullness through the life of Jesus Christ, through his life. And that's the message today, folks, that Christ came to fulfill all things, all things. So here on the river, on the, on the banks of the River Jordan, Jesus fulfills the baptism of repentance. He comes to fulfill those, those waters, and, and, and already John's been telling people to prepare yourself. For the Messiah is coming. Prepare yourself. Dedicate yourself with the life that leads to God. Loving him. Loving his his statutes. Loving your neighbor as yourself. It was a desire, he said, to cast off all things. A desire to cast off all unrighteousness from their lives and ridding themselves of sinful attachments. See, our Lord now comes sanctifying, fulfilling. He's in the waters sanctifying those waters, but not just those, but all waters everywhere. The waters in our font, the waters from all times, baptizing you with that. You know, Jesus will soon fulfill the act of of baptism itself by going down underneath the earth for us. He sanctified and fulfilled that coming up out of of the ground with that glorious resurrection, fulfilling all things. See, he also fulfills the, the demands that he places upon our lives, on all people. You know, they, that they were not just to, going to have to walk through this life just, just trying and, and, and all their blood, sweat, and tears to live a life totally devoted to God. He said, now I've given you something. I've given you a help. I've given you assistance in your life. For it was Jesus who was about to send the great helper. Jesus said, I will send you the great comforter in your time of need. Jesus said, that I will send you the great teacher to show you all things, the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it was fitting, he said, that such things must take place. You know, the Gospels, Paul's epistles, all the, the, the disciples' pastoral letters, and even John's revelation speaks of Jesus fulfilling all things. You know, and, and we, you read in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks that he's fulfilled the law. He's fulfilled the, the promise of Moses. He's fulfilled all these things. And he comes to fulfill where we are at in our lives. The things that, that, that we are called to do, he's fulfilled those things. Did Jesus fulfill all the rightness just, uh, of the marriage covenant? Remember at the wedding of Cana, he fulfilled that and began to teach about it to the Sadducees, Pharisees. He fulfilled how we are to conduct ourselves when he preached upon uh, the mountain about the Beatitudes. He fulfilled how we are supposed to conduct ourselves when he spoke about the end times, fulfilling all things. And the apostle Peter went so far to say that he fulfilled even our death as he descended into hell and rose us up again. 
You know, it's not complicated to see that Jesus had a purpose. But what about us? What is our purpose? What is our purpose in life, particularly in the light of God? And, you know, and I hate to use an old worn-out cliche, but it is so true. You know, that well, you've heard the saying that, that we were all born with a purpose. But that is true. We were all born with a purpose. But, you know, finding exactly what that means can almost seem impossible. Amen? I actually can seem almost impossible. If I've heard, heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, what was I created for? I've even asked that question myself. In the world, you can actually find out what you were created for. You can take all types of tests that would determine your purpose in life. And, and you ever heard of the Myers-Briggs personality test? Well, if you take that, that will determine your, your, your best, uh, the suitable field that best uh, is, is suited to your personality type. And for those familiar with this test, I tested as an ISJT, which means the I means I'm introverted, which is probably no shock there. It means that I'm sensing. That means that, that I love facts. I love data. And the J means that I'm judging. That means that I love a schedule. I got to have a plan. I don't like spontaneity too much. And the T means I'm thinking. I, I'm, a, I'm a thinker more than I am a feeler. And I'm kind of a rational kind of guy. And the test suggests that, that these are, there are certain careers out there that are best suited for me. There was accounting. There was management, auditing, an engineer, a dentist for, for one, and a stockbroker's in law. But apparently you have to have an high IQ for one of those jobs. Sorry, Don. So, but, you know, ironically, I chose the, the, the path that least likely for ISJTs to ever have. And that is the ministry. Someone who is, uh, has, uh, requires abstract thinking and have an a, a interpersonal spontaneity. I think God definitely has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Does he not? A sense of humor. You know, but honestly, no matter what career we find ourselves in or, or what we decide to do with our lives, we will ultimately be unfulfilled if we do not find our created purpose. You know, so what do I mean by that? Well, I mean we must find out our purpose within the life of Jesus Christ. You know, otherwise, we're going to remain empty. We're going to remain unfulfilled with just only just an appearance of faith, of just going through the motions day in and day out of our life, Sunday after Sunday. Speaking the same old things. And this is evident, folks. If, if Sunday morning is your only time that, that you eat that meat, what the Bible says, then it's just a shallowness of what's available. It's just a, a, a shallow, a shallow a, um, um, hole that, that, that is empty. See, so we must come into something that is fuller. And God's inviting us to that. Shallowness of faith tends to breeds all, breeds all types of things. You know, shallowness of faith tend, tends to breed uh, sinful perception that robs us of our obligations to Jesus Christ. Such things as suspicion kind of comes up in our lives if we're shallow. And that leads to some type of a paranoia. It leads to strife. It leads to, to turmoil that tears us apart. It tears our, our very core, who what we were created to be, apart. And, and love where, where it goes out the window. Divine love is gone and finger pointing kind of abounds in our lives. See, Jesus has not only called us into his redemptive water, folks, but he also beckons us to come a little deeper, to come out a little deeper into the deep end of the pool, so to speak. And if we remain in the shallowness of faith, we will never, ever learn to swim. And everybody, we're going to be tossed to and fro with all kinds of strange teachings and doctrines, knowing where to go right, don't know if we should go left. And we will never take that chance to experience the depth of Jesus Christ, of God's mysteries revealed to all to humanity through his only begotten son. You know, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, it takes courage, folks. It takes courage to plunge yourself into the deep. You know, it means shedding off all those safety rings of childish things. Now, I like to quote uh, Sarah from Rose. Now, many of us don't know who that is. But he's a great author. He, lived, he died back in the 1980s. But he was speaking about courage. And he says this. He says, fulfilling the authentic Christian life is very difficult. And that one must grasp and hold on to it, not only firmly, not only with one's might, but with a certain toughness and tenacity, even a fierceness. Because everything in this world, everything in this life is constantly trying to steal it away and substitute some cheap imitation. 
Did you catch that last part? It says, everything in this life is constantly trying to steal it away and substitute it with some cheap imitation. Are there any cheap imitations being allowed into your life today? Paul implied that it is up to each one of us here this morning. It is up to each one of us has a task to whether we decide if we really want to fulfill our created purpose or not when he said this. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. To totally surrender your life will involve letting go of all preconceived worldly um, ideas, worldly practices. If you will enter into this life with such a firmness of, of tenacity, as Seraphim Rose would say, God promises, Jesus fulfilled it, God promises he will transform your life. He will transform your life. Read the scriptures. Pray without ceasing. Throw yourself into into giving. Fast often. Brothers and sisters, may God help us all to fulfill our created purpose. And may he grant us that wonderful access into fellowship of eternity. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious God, we... Acknowledge that we are unworthy. We are so unworthy, God, to to even call upon your names with sinful lips and sinful hearts. But, God, we have heard this morning that you have totally redeemed us. If we would just have the courage to take hold of what's been laid before us, to come out into the deeper waters of faith, O God. Lord, we pray that you give each one of us the courage to strip off all these uh, these worldly attachments that we have clinged to. That, Lord, that we will stop listening to the many, many voices that are continuously distracting us from your truth. That are tossing us back and forth in these ways of confusion. But, God, that we will grasp the love. That we will grasp the, the eternal truth that is before us. Strengthen us, O oh God, for the journey ahead. For in these times and days we need it. For in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You would let us all stand as we sing our closing song together. Like I'm breathing Am I alive? I won't
Guys, it was so great to see you in the house of God today. And before we receive, before I give the benediction, uh, we reminder that we are having Wednesday night live this Wednesday. And if you would, can we have some volunteers to please help put up the chairs today? Thank you. All right, receive the benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the God, our Father Almighty, be with you now and for always. Amen.